The floor is yours, Tiberio, and congratulations for setting in your foundations.
De aceea am ales și forma de organizare de fundație. Avem un Consiliu Director și aș vrea să prezint membrii Consiliului în ordinea în care sunt așezați. Îl prezint pe Sorin Mihai Vărțorici. Vă lăsă la părere. Sorin este primul Sorin este primul român din România care a împărtășit idealurile Fundației Proctă de Programe Liberă, Fins of the Foundation, și a mea. Celălalt fiind, al doilea fiind din Republica Moldova, Iurie Nistru, în această ordine. Iurie Nistru, din păcate, n-a putut din cauza vizei să fie prezentată de noi astăzi. În continuare, l-am cunoscut pe Victor, care Victor Nistru, care a evoluat foarte, foarte bine, s-a implicat foarte mult pe partea tehnică, de aceea este și directorul nostru tehnic, și avea deja formată o filozofie, pentru că era contribuitor la proiectul de Dian și încă este. Și proiectul de Dian promovează destul de mult filozofia programului liberă ale fundației Prince of the Foundation. Și, în ultimul rând, aș vrea să-mi prezint pe Gheorghe Zucravo. Gheorghe Zucravo este uh, coordonatorul nostru din Republica Moldova și uh, membru Consiliu Director. Uh, este, în Republica Moldova a fost prima echipă locală înființată uh, de uh, Ceata și uh, lui Iurie și lui Gheorghe îi datorăm, îi datorăm foarte mult uh, din ceea ce am reușit să facem, din puținul pe care am reușit să-l facem, la Republica Moldova. Am organizat uh, patru evenimente, începând cu 2012, valul 2012. Și avem, uh, cred că, 10-15 membri activi în uh, Republica Moldova, pe care nu i-am indicat doar în uh, comunitatea noastră, ci și în alte proiecte internaționale. Uh, acesta fiind spuse despre uh, Ceata și Fundația Ceata, din care s-a înființat în această lună. Vă mulțumesc pentru atenție și în cazul în care aveți întrebări, putem să rezolvăm 10 minute pentru acestea. Mâna sus cine are întrebări, vă rog. Bun. Deci, doi oameni, da? Înseamnă că va merge foarte repede. Poate cineva să mă ajute cu microfonul.
but we can we can we can try. Okay, they are George. Thank you. Deci am făcut o aplicație pentru Firefox OS care interacționează cu Text Online printr-un serviciu pus la dispoziție de Text Online. Și pe lângă acestea mai avem și registrări făcute de noi și avem și prezentări în formate libere. Avem și o revistă de publicație electronică numită Filiber.ro în care am publicat de-a lungul a doi ani și jumătate articole libere despre alte tehnologii libere. Și cred că vom continua să facem o treabă bună. Altă întrebare? Ați venerat o listă de organizații cu care ați colaborat. Ați colaborat și cu cei de la IFF? FF, poate? FF. Da. Nu. Nu am colaborat. Te rog. De ce nu? First, some requests. If you take a photo of me, please do not post it in Facebook. <laughs> Facebook is a monstrous surveillance engine. But, but if you post a photo of someone in Facebook, That gives Facebook one more opportunity to surveil that person. 
we can discuss whether putting a photo of your friend in Facebook is decent treatment of a friend, but that doesn't affect me personally. Whereas putting a photo of me in Facebook hurts me personally. Please don't do it. And if you take photos of me with a phone, and you want to distribute a copy to anyone in any fashion, make sure you have deleted geolocation information from it first. I recommend doing that with photos of anybody whatsoever, but I only make the request for me. Second, if you record this talk, audio or video, and you want to distribute copies, please do so only in the formats that are favorable to free software. Those are Og Theora and Web. So no MP anything. Certainly no Flash. And no uh, Real Player, Windows Media Player, or QuickTime. Please, if you distribute it on a website, make sure that people can access it without having to run any non-free JavaScript software. And please put on the recording the license Creative Commons No Derivatives, because this is a presentation of my personal views.
program is free software if it comes with the four essential freedoms. So there are many, free, there are many empty chairs over there. Uh, on that side you can find many. There are a few over here as well. <clears throat> freedom zero is the freedom to run the program as you wish. Freedom one is the freedom to study the source code and then change it to make the program do your computing as you wish. Freedom two is the freedom to help others to redistribute exact copies of the program when you wish. And freedom three is the freedom to contribute to your community. That's the freedom to distribute copies of your modified versions when you wish. So if the program comes with these four freedoms adequately, then it's free software because the social system of its distribution and use is an ethical one, one that respects freedom and community. But if one of these freedoms is missing or insufficient, the program is user-subjugating software because it imposes an unethical social system on its users. <clears throat> in order for these freedoms to be adequate, they must apply to all the activities in life, including business. Now, corporations are not people, and they are not entitled to human rights. However, it's not good for society to let company A have control over company B's computing. So company B ought to have control of its own computing also. And therefore free software applies to businesses. These issues apply to businesses as well as to individuals. But Note that these four freedoms are not obligations. You're not required to do any of these things with free software. Free software means you're free to do them if you wish. Thus, with Freedom Zero, you're free to run the program as you wish, but it's not required. If you're a masochist, you can run it as you don't wish. You also have the option not to run the program. With Freedom One, you are free to study the source code and change it, but it's not required. You're also allowed to receive the program and run it right away without looking at anything. And that's the usual case because we're all busy. You know? With Freedom Two, you're free to make copies and distribute them to others. You can give them away, you can sell them, but it's not required. It's up to you when you do that. We don't say, you must cooperate with all of them. Rather, we insist that you be free to do so. We insist that nobody else say to you, you may not cooperate with them. And with Freedom 3, if you have made a modified version, you're free to distribute copies of it, but it's not a requirement. You can use your copy, your modified version, privately. That it's private software which is okay. It's free and it's private. Whether you distribute copies to others is up to you. So, as you can see, the distinction between free and proprietary software, proprietary means non-free, and it's different from private. The distinction is not a technical one. It's not about the features of the program. It's not about how it works. It's not about how the code was written. Those are all technical details. This distinction is an ethical, social, and political distinction, which is why it's so important. The use of a free program in society is development. Every program embodies knowledge. If it's free, that knowledge is available for the users to understand. They can maintain, adapt, and extend the program. They can also use their knowledge in other ways. But the use of a proprietary program in society 
is not development, it's dependence. Imposed dependence on one particular entity. That is a social problem. If we see proprietary software in use, we should try to put an end to that problem. To write a free program is a for release to the public is a contribution to society. How much? That depends what the program does. If it does a lot of useful things, then it's a big contribution. If it does very little and doesn't work well, it's a tiny contribution. But at least if it's free software, it's distributed in such a way that it contributes whatever it has to offer. But to develop a proprietary program is no contribution. It's a power grab. It's an attempt to subjugate others. In social terms, this proprietary program is a trap. If it has attractive features, those are the bait. Paradoxically, convenient features do not make a program, a proprietary program, better. They make it more harmful, more damaging. So if you have the choice to develop a proprietary program or do nothing at all, morally speaking, you should do nothing at all because that way you don't do harm. In real life, you probably have more than those two choices. You have some other options which might be better than both. But when we consider just these two options, never develop a proprietary program. Do nothing instead. At least do no harm. Thus, the goal of the free software movement is that all programs be free so that all their users can be free. But why are these four freedoms essential? Why define free software this way? Each freedom has a reason. Freedom to, the freedom to help others, the freedom to make and distribute exact copies, is essential on fundamental moral grounds, so you can live an upright, ethical life as a good member of your community. If you use a program without freedom too, you are in danger of falling into a moral dilemma whenever your good friend says, that program looks nice, can I have a copy? At that moment, you will face a choice between two evils. One evil is to give your good friend a copy and violate the license of the program. The other evil is to refuse your good friend a copy and comply with the license of the program. If you are in this dilemma, you ought to choose the lesser evil which is to give your good friend a copy and violate the license of the program. Why is this the lesser evil? If you can't avoid doing wrong to somebody or other, it's less bad to do wrong to somebody who deserves it because he has done wrong. The developer, well first of all, we can assume that your good friend is a good member of your community and normally deserves your cooperation. There may be exceptions, but that's the usual case. By contrast, the developer of the proprietary program has deliberately attacked the social solidarity of your community, which is very bad. So, if you have to do wrong to your good friend or the developer, do it to the developer. However, being the lesser evil does not mean it's good. It's never good to make an agreement and break it. Not even an evil agreement like this one. With an evil agreement, keeping it is worse than breaking it. But still, breaking it is not good. And if you give your good friend a copy, what will she have? 
She will have an unauthorized copy of a proprietary program, and that's a rather nasty thing. Almost as nasty as an authorized copy of the same program. <laughs> it's nasty because it's proprietary. So when you have fully understood this dilemma, what should you really do? You should make sure you never fall into it. Take precautions in advance. Don't risk being in the dilemma. I know two ways to avoid it. One is, don't have any friends. <laughs> That's what the proprietary developers have in mind for you. Instead of friends, you could have Facebook friends. <laughs> the other method, my method, is reject that program. If you don't have a copy yourself, you can't fall into the dilemma. So that's what I do. If someone offers me a program, no matter how attractive it might be, on the condition that I not share it with you, I say, my conscience does not allow me to accept those evil conditions, therefore I won't use your program, take it out of here. That's what you should say also. You should reject software that denies freedom too. And reject also the propaganda terms that the proprietary developers use to demonize cooperation. For instance, they say copying is theft. Since we're in a school of law, I should point out that that's a lie. Any lawyer should know copying is not theft. And in most cases, it's not even a crime. Even if it is copyright infringement or violating some contract, that's not normally a crime. And they use the word piracy. <clears throat> well, Piracy means attacking ships. <laughs> and that's very bad. But sharing is good. So we shouldn't call them by the same name. So when people ask me what I think of piracy, I say attacking ships is very bad. And if they ask what I think of movie piracy, I say, I like the first Pirates of the Caribbean, <laughs> but not the second because that was unfair to parrots. And I like parrots. So you get the point. I look for a funny way of pointedly rejecting their propaganda term. If you follow somebody else, in using the enemy's propaganda terms. You're supporting the enemy's propaganda. So teach yourself never to accept, quote, piracy, unquote, as a reference to sharing. If someone asks you what do you think of software piracy, don't give a serious answer because that would be endorsing the use of the word, quote, piracy, unquote, to refer to sharing. So that's the reason for freedom too. The freedom to help others. The freedom to make and distribute exact copies when you wish. Essential on fundamental moral grounds. But freedom zero, the freedom to run the program as you wish, is essential for a different reason. So you can have control over your own computing. Every user deserves control over his own computing. There are proprietary programs whose licenses restrict even the use of authorized copies. For instance, there's a proprietary program for managing websites 
whose license forbids using it to publish anything that criticizes the program's developer. In this case, proprietary software literally denies the user's freedom of speech. Well, if you can't even freely use the copy that's supposed to be there for you to use, you don't control your computing. So freedom zero is essential, but it's not enough because that's the freedom to either do or not do whatever the code is set up to let you do, which means the developer still controls your computing, not through the license if you have freedom zero, but instead through the code itself. So, to have control of your own computing, you need freedom one, which is the freedom to study the source code and change it to make the program do your computing as you wish. Now, the source code of the program typically looks sort of like algebra. And if you know how to program, you can understand what that does and you can change it. Whereas programs are often distributed in executable binary form, which even programmers can't understand easily. So that's the distinction. They, they should make available the source code, which is the form of the program that the developers use to understand what they're doing and to write it. They should not make it any harder for you to understand than it is for them. And it, it, they should not make it any harder for you to change it than it is for them. Of course, it's hard work. That they can't get rid of, but that's not anybody's fault. That's just the way it is. But they must not make it harder for you than it is for them. <clears throat> now, this freedom includes having the option to actually install and run your version. Nowadays, many devices are built such that they, re they will only run versions signed by the developer. And if you have the source code and you change it, the machine will refuse to run your version. Well, that's not having the freedom to change how the program works. So that's not, that doesn't qualify as freedom one. If they can make a new version that will run in your computer, you must be allowed to run your version in your computer. That's what it means to have the freedom to change the program so it does your computing the way you wish. Now, if you don't have freedom one, you can't even tell what the program really does. And often proprietary programs have malicious features, malicious functionalities that do things such as spy on the user, restrict the user. There are even back doors that receive commands remotely to do something perhaps nasty to the user without asking permission. There are many rare dangers in life. Today, you might get hit by a car, but you probably won't. It's a rare danger. And there, of course, are thousands of rare dangers in life. But mostly, we go through our lives and these things don't happen to us. Being the victim of proprietary malware is not a rare danger. It's the usual case Almost everyone who is using proprietary software is the victim of malicious functionalities. Let me prove this with a list of examples. One proprietary package that has all three kinds of malicious speech functionality that you may have heard of is called Microsoft Windows. There are known surveillance features in Microsoft Windows. There are digital handcuffs, the functionalities that restrict what users can do with the data they have in their machine. These, of course, can't be hidden. The users can tell that the system refuses to do these things. There are also known backdoors. 
So, Windows is malware, literally. Malware means software designed to hurt the user. Windows is malware. But it's even worse because one of these backdoors gives Microsoft or anyone else that knows the secret for how to use it the power to remotely install software changes. Which means that any malicious functionality that is not in Windows today could be remotely installed tomorrow. This is a universal backdoor because it can be used to do absolutely anything. It's in the same sense that a computer is a universal machine. It can be programmed to do anything computable. So, Windows is universal malware. But it's not alone. MacOS is malware too. It has digital handcuffs the functionalities to restrict people. These are also known as DRM, Digital Restrictions Management. The software in the iThings, Apple's newer and monstrous products, is much worse. People have found several surveillance features. They have the tightest digital handcuffs ever known in general purpose computing. Apple was the pioneer in seizing control over users' installation of application programs. By the way, there are some seats over there and also over there. If you'd like to sit down, don't be shy. <clears throat> ah, he left instead. <laughs> Uh, <clears throat> this had previously been known in game consoles, but Apple was the first to take this increased power over users of general purpose computers. In effect, converting their products into jails for the users. And who said this? The users themselves, because when they find ways to break those particular handcuffs, they call it jailbreaking, which means escaping from jail, recognizing that those products are designed to be jails. And they have an acknowledged backdoor. So, the software in the eye things is malware. Then there's Flash Player, which has a surveillance feature and digital handcuffs. Flash Player is gratis, but it's not Lieber. And you can see this in the fact that it has malicious features and the users can't remove them. <clears throat> so, is it of any importance at all that Flash Player is gratis? It means that Adobe does not require users to pay to be abused. <laughs> then there's Angry Birds. Angry Birds is spyware. It collects location information. Many apps for smartphones are spyware or in other ways malicious. <clears throat> then there is the PlayStation 3. As I said, the feature of restricting what programs people can run existed in game consoles first. And there is a lot of digital handcuff in the PlayStation 3, somebody found a way to jailbreak it and install other software. And Sony sent the police after him, which is why we call for a total boycott of Sony. And there, is, there are boycott Sony stickers, although they're turned upside down so you can't see what they say. <clears throat> And then there's the Amazon Swindle, an e-reader that swindles readers out of the traditional freedoms of readers of books. For instance, there's the freedom to acquire a book anonymously, paying cash.
which is the way I buy books. I won't identify myself to a database when I buy a book. But you can't do that with the swindle. Amazon doesn't accept cash. Then there's the freedom to give the book to somebody else after you read it, or lend it to various friends, or sell it to a used bookstore. The Amazon abolishes these freedoms for the swindle with digital handcuffs, together with contracts that say that you can't own a book. Amazon does not respect private property. Amazon says, all of your books are belong to us. <laughs> and then there's the freedom to keep the book as long as you wish, which Amazon eliminates with a back door. We only know about this back door by observation. We don't know all the things it can do. We know it can be used to remotely erase books. Because in 2009, Amazon used it to remotely erase thousands of copies of a particular book. These were authorized copies until that day. An Orwellian act. And what was the book? It was 1984 by George Orwell. A book that presents a totalitarian state whose crimes against humanity began with destroying the books it didn't like. So everyone should read this book, 1984, but not in the swindle. Now, the official name of that product is the Kindle. Kindle means to start a fire, which I suppose is meant to suggest that the real purpose of that product is virtual book burning of our books, except that they say that the books are not ours in the first place. And then there are nearly all portable phones Portable phones are full of non-free software. Well, a few of them have only a little non-free software, but there's none that's made now that can run without non-free software. And in general, that non-free software has a, a surveillance feature and a backdoor. <clears throat> the surveillance feature transmits the location frequently, and the user can't stop it. It'll transmit the location on re in response to a remote command. The back door is universal. It allows remote installation of software changes. And this has been used to convert portable phones into listening devices that transmit all the conversation in the room. You don't have to talk into the microphone. It can hear you if it's over there. And it transmits all the time, even when it appears to be switched off. So, you've heard of software that has bugs. This software is a bug. <clears throat> Programs. We don't know if they're malware. It's hard to find out because we don't have their source code. So effectively, every program without Freedom 1 is just trust us software. It demands blind faith. The developer says, we're a big corporation. Of course you can trust a corporation. No corporation ever mistreated the public. But I'm sure there are some non-free programs whose developers were honest and did not put in any malicious functionalities. We can't tell which ones they are, but I'm sure there are some. What can we say about that? Well, their developers are human, so they make mistakes. 
The code of those programs has bugs. Because every non-trivial program has bugs. You can't avoid it. <clears throat> but the user of a program without Freedom 1 is just as helpless against an accidental bug as against an intentional malicious functionality. If you use a program without Freedom 1, you're a prisoner of the code. We free software developers are human too. We also make mistakes. Our free programs have bugs too, because every non-trivial program has bugs. But, <clears throat> if you find a bug in our free code, or anything in the code you don't like, you're free to change it, because we did not make you a prisoner. We can't be perfect. We can respect your freedom. Thus, freedom one is essential. But it's not enough, because that's the freedom to personally study and change the source code, or to do so within one organization. Well, that's not enough because, first of all, most users don't know how to program. They don't know how to exercise Freedom 1. But even for programmers like me, Freedom 1 is not enough. The reason is each one of us is busy doing certain things. Nobody has time to study and take care of all the programs she uses. Besides, every computer user nowadays will use thousands of programs and no one person can possibly study and master all that source code or personally write all the changes she might wish. This is more work than one human being can do. So the only way we can have fully, effectively control over our computing is to do it collaborating, working together. And for this we need Freedom 3. Freedom 3 gives us collective control over our computing. It means that any group of people can work together adapting a version of the program to do what they wish. <clears throat> and when, because with Freedom 3 they can send their changed versions back and forth to each other. And then when they're happy with it, they can offer it to the public as well. And that way, all those users that don't know how to program can get this improved version and use it if they wish. Without Freedom 3, yes, each one of us would be free to make that change. But what a waste it would be to have to write the same change millions of times. And the people who don't know how would be left out completely. So Freedom 3 is essential. And all users get the benefit of these four freedoms. Every user can exercise freedom zero and freedom two to run the program as you wish and redistribute exact copies because these don't require programming. Freedoms one and three to study and change the source code and then optionally distribute copies of your modified version, these entail programming. So, the only users that can do this are the ones that know how to do this. But everyone gets the benefit of living in a society where we have these freedoms. Because when other people, those who do know how to program, make modified versions and distribute them, everybody gets to use them if we wish. So we get the benefit of living in a society where people have these freedoms. And you can also indirectly take advantage of freedom one and three. Even if you don't know how to do it yourself, you can convince somebody else to do it for you. If you want to change in a program, let's assume you're not a programmer, you don't know how to do it yourself. Well, what then? If the program is proprietary, all you can do is beg the developer, please, almighty developer, make this change for me. But if it's free software, well, maybe your cousin's a programmer. You can convince your cousin to make the change for you. Or maybe not. Maybe you have to pay a programmer to make the change for you. But you can do it. Just as if you want a change in your house, 
and you don't know how to do carpentry and plumbing, there are people who, whose profession or trade is that you pay them to do it for you. And lots of people take advantage of this and hire carpenters and plumbers to do work on their houses. And you can likewise hire a programmer to do work on your program if it's free software, because then it lets you. You make a contract with the programmer you chose, and this is a free market, no barriers to entry, lots of people have the skill that's needed so they can enter this market. Well, you give a copy to that programmer of the program you are running. That, that way you exercise your freedom number two. Then the programmer studies the code and changes it, and then make exercising freedom one, and then distributes a copy to you, exercising his freedom number three. And then, if you decide it's good enough to use, and you use it, you pay it. And this is how a substantial part of free software business works. <clears throat> and the four freedoms together give us democracy. A free program develops democratically under the control of its users. Because every user is free to participate in society's decision about the future of that program. Which is simply the sum total of the decisions made by all the various users of the program. By contrast, a proprietary program develops under the dictatorship of its owner and then functions as an instrument of power over the users. With software, there are just two possibilities. Either the users control the program or the program controls the users. The first case is free software. The four freedoms are essential because those are the freedoms that the users need to fully have control over the program and the computing they do with it. They need individual control and collective control. And the freedoms 0 and 1 give individual control. With freedoms 2 and 3, we have also collective control. <clears throat> but if the users don't have these freedoms, then they don't control the program, so the program controls the users, and the owner controls the program, and thus through it, the owner exercises power over the users. And this non-free program is simply an instrument of power. And the owner typically is fully aware of the power that it has over the users, and thus feels the temptation to put in malicious features. This is why malicious features are so common in proprietary software. Systematically, the owners feel the temptation and they give into it because they're typically corporations, in other words, psychopaths by structure. <clears throat> Whereas, with free software, nobody has power over anybody, and thus the developers usually don't face the same kind of temptation. And that's why malicious functionalities are rare in free software. So, society has a choice to make. On one side, we have individual freedom, social solidarity, and democracy. On the other, we have the dictatorship of the software owner over the users. Society must reject proprietary software and choose free software. Thus, the ultimate goal of the free software movement is the liberation of cyberspace and all its inhabitants. We invite you to escape from proprietary software and come live with us in the free world that we have built. Just a second, it's time for more tea.
I started the free software movement in 1983. I wanted to make it possible to use a computer and have freedom. That was impossible at the time. Because the computer won't really do anything for you without an operating system installed. And all the operating systems for the modern computers of that time were proprietary. So, for instance, if you bought a new PC, in order to make it useful, you needed to have a proprietary operating system installed, and there went your freedom. So how could I change that? I was one man without much money, without much fame, and few people agreed with me. So I didn't think I could change much with an ordinary political movement where you protest in the street and you send letters to officials. And besides, I had no experience doing that. I was not a political organizer. I was an operating system developer. But, as an operating system developer, that meant there was another way I could achieve the same goal. All I had to do was write an operating system. Then, as the author, I could legally make it free software. And then, everyone would be able to run computers in freedom by using my system. In other words, I could rescue some people from the injustice of proprietary software by doing technical work in my own field. I was aware of the injustice of proprietary software, which most people did not recognize as an injustice. I had the skill necessary to give people an escape route from this injustice, and it looked like nobody was going to do it if not me. That meant I had been elected by circumstances to do this job. It was my duty. It's as if you see somebody drowning, and you know how to swim, and there's no one else around, and it's not Bush. <laughs> then you have a moral duty to save this person. Well, perhaps that statement is too strong. Perhaps we could identify some other people, like Bush's torturers and the people who, like Obama, who protect Bush's torturers and the other people in various countries, wasn't Romania one of them, who cooperated with CIA kidnapping and torture? Well, this could be a big list of people whom we perhaps should, about whom I should perhaps not affirm a moral duty to save them. Fortunately, I don't need to make this list because I don't know how to swim. <laughs> but in the real instance in my life, the work to be done was not swimming. It was writing lots of code, and I knew how to do that. So I decided to develop an operating system that would be totally free software. Every line would be free software. The point is, if there's any piece of the system which is non-free, that's a part of you which has changed. So in order for the system to respect your freedom, every piece must be free software. So, then I decided to recruit others to help write it, to finish it sooner. Then I decided to make it a Unix-like operating system. That is, it would look and work just like the Unix system. Unix was a proprietary operating system with some technical advantages and it was widely used. By making my system compatible with Unix, I would make it easy for lots of people to switch to it, because they would already know how to use it. And then I gave it a name, which is a joke. The name of the system is GNU, G-N-U. And this is a joke because it's a recursive acronym. G-N-U stands for GNU's Not Unix. Of course, we programmers love jokes involving recursion. 
But actually, there's another meaning to this. Recursive acronyms like this one were the customary way in my community to give credit in the case where you made a program similar to some existing program. So, by calling it GNU's not Unix, I was giving credit to the ideas I would get from Unix. But also expressing the most important thing about this system, namely, it's not Unix. Unix was proprietary software. You couldn't possibly use Unix to have freedom. In order to make a system that could respect your freedom, we would have to rewrite every piece from zero. We couldn't use any of the code of Unix. That would have been illegal, and, or else it would have meant the system was not free and it would fail to do its job. Now, the word GNU is an even better joke than you might think. Well, first of all, in order to be a joke, it needs two meanings. Well, GNU is not Unix is one meaning, but there has to be a second meaning. Fortunately, that is a word. It's the name of an animal that lives in Africa. <clears throat> and if you watch uh, uh, wild animal programs, you've probably seen a bunch of GNUs. Uh, but actually, though, the word GNU is the most humor-charged word in the English language because according to the dictionary, it's pronounced new. So every time you want to write the word new, you can spell it G-N-U and you've got a joke. Perhaps not a very good joke, <laughs> but there are lots of them. So we have been taught to associate this word with laughter. However, when it's the name of our system, please do not follow the dictionary. If you say the new operating system, you'll get people confused. You see, we've been working on it since January 1984, which is over 29 years. And we've been using it for over 20 years, so it's not new anymore. But it still is GNU, and will always be GNU. The other erroneous pronunciation that you've probably heard that you should avoid using sounds like Linux. It's amazing, but most of the time when people talk about the GNU system, they erroneously call it Linux. This is a confusion that started in 1992. At that point, we had almost all of the necessary pieces for the GNU system, but one major essential component was still missing. That component was the kernel. The kernel of an operating system is the component that allocates the machine's resources to all the other programs. <coughs> developed a kernel, but it was too ambitious a project. I chose an elegant design. I didn't write it, we hired a person to write it, and it took six years to have a test version. It works, but it doesn't work all that well, so mostly people don't use it. Mostly they use the kernel Linux. Linux was started in 1991 by Mr. Torvalds as proprietary software. Its license was not free because it was too restrictive. It didn't fully give you the four freedoms. However, in 92, he changed the license and he adopted the GNU General Public License, which is a free software license that I have written for use in the, as the license of GNU programs. But I had designed it so anyone else could release a program under that same license.
So that's what Torvalds did in 1992. And when he liberated Linux, at that point the combination of Linux plus the various big and small pieces of the GNU system made a complete free operating system, which was basically GNU, but also contained Linux. So it was the GNU plus Linux system, if you want to be fair. However, the people who combined them, since we still thought that our kernel would be working any week now, we were not at first interested in Linux. So other people put Linux together with various components of GNU, and those people were focused so much on this one component Linux that they started referring to the whole thing as a Linux system. Essentially, talking about something that was mainly our work and giving us none of the credit, which is not nice. So when you talk about the system, please call it GNU plus Linux. Please give us equal mention. The GNU project is the principal developer of the system. There are many other contributors, of course, more than you could mention. But you shouldn't leave out the principal developer. Now, this error in naming has real practical effects today. The problem is that lots of people think that the system was started by Mr. Torvalds, that it comes from his vision of life, and that it exists thanks to his ideas. So they tend to admire him and follow his ideas and ignore and despise ours. And what are his ideas? Well, he doesn't believe that you deserve freedom in your computing. He doesn't believe he deserves freedom in his computing. He doesn't think it's important. He says that he's happy to use non-free software as long as it's powerful and reliable. And as far as I know, he hasn't confronted the fact that it's likely to be malicious. So he has a right to his views. He has a right to promote his views. He's not entitled to cite our work that we did for the sake of your freedom as if it were his work in support of his opposition to our motives for doing this work. But that's exactly what happens when people think the system is Linux. So, Please help make people aware of what our campaign for freedom has given them by calling the system GNU plus Linux or GNU slash Linux. Now, freedom is frequently threatened. To keep it, you must defend it. This is true in all areas of life. And in most areas of life, the debate about human rights has gone on for decades or centuries, which is enough time to reach conclusions about what human rights people ought to have and spread them around the world. This doesn't always mean we succeed in defending human rights, but sometimes we succeed. At least it's a base for trying. However, computing is a very new area of life. 20 years ago, even in the most advanced countries, most people didn't use computing yet. Now that's not much time to have the debate about what human rights a person deserves in using a program. But in fact, the debate mostly never happened. Almost everyone started using computers with proprietary software in an environment of other users of proprietary software, and they didn't imagine it could be any other way. So they took for granted that proprietary software was ethically legitimate, which means that in effect, they allowed the owners to dictate the answer to that question, what human rights do you deserve in using a program? And they dictated essentially none at all. They dictated that they can impose any conditions they like. 
And most people accepted this, but not we in the free software movement. We are trying to start this debate. We say that we've identified four human rights that you deserve in using a program. And those are the four freedoms that define free software. <clears throat> but when we try to bring these ideas to the attention of the public, or even the users of the GNU system, we run into two obstacles. First of all, the users of the GNU system think it's Linux, and they think it was started by Mr. Torvalds, and it all comes from his vision of life. They think of themselves as Linux users. So when they see where we present our ethical ideas, they say, that comes from those GNU fanatics. Why should I read that? I'm a Linux user. I admire the pragmatic philosophy of Mr. Torvalds. I should point out that pragmatic in issues of politics typically means taking important long-term decisions based on short-term convenience, and that it's not the right or a wise way to make decisions about anything important. But in any case, they are users of the GNU, and they refuse to read what we say because they don't know it's GNU. They think it's Linux. If they knew what, si what the system is that, that they're using, they'd say something different to themselves. They'd say, ah, here's the philosophy of the GNU project, and I'm a GNU plus Linux user. I had better pay attention to this, because my system comes from there. And then we would have a chance to convince them that they deserve freedom and they should fight for it. But there's another obstacle. Nowadays, in English and some other languages, you will rarely see the term free software. Instead, the people who disagree with us have another term that they use, quote, open source, unquote. That term stands for a choice not to consider the issue in ethical terms, not to regard this as a matter of justice versus injustice. During the 90s, as GNU slash Linux spread in the, initially among technical people, a lot of them saw that it had practical advantages. It was powerful, reliable, efficient, cheap to use, it was cool. So they recommended it to their friends, but they didn't talk about ethical issues because they hadn't heard about them. So, we ended up in the free software community with two different political camps. There was the free software movement, those of us who said, the goal here is to have freedom in our computing, therefore we must replace all the proprietary software and not use it. And then there were the other people who liked and often and typically used and in many cases contributed to development of free programs but they didn't see it as a matter of right versus wrong. So they would only present practical reasons for using the same free software. And there was a debate between the camps and people coming into the community could see the debate and thus they would see there was a free software movement. In effect, our software carried our philosophy and showed it to people. But in 1998, the people in the other camp coined the term open source, which had not been used in computing before, as a way to refer to free software without suggesting that it's an issue of freedom. Because they had a new term, they could choose which ideas to mention and which ideas to omit. They omitted the entire ethical level of the issue. 
They presented this in terms of practical convenience values only. So they wouldn't say, you deserve to have control of your computing, so reject proprietary software. They wouldn't talk about practical advantages you might get from switching to GNU slash Linux. <clears throat> we say if you develop and release a program, it's your moral duty to respect the freedom of the other users by releasing it as free software. They would say, if you develop and release a program, it's in your practical interest to let the users change it and redistribute it because they will improve the code quality. They don't appeal to anything deeper than code quality as a reason. So in practice, we and they do the same work, and we can work together. However, at a deeper level, our views are totally different from theirs. Our values are different from theirs. Anyway, open source was a majority of the community, and the businesses were mainly with them, because there were already quite a few free software businesses by 1998. And mostly the politicians and the journalists followed them. And since then, in the US, you rarely see any mention of free software in the media. They only talk about open source. If they mention us, they pretend that we are open source supporters, misrepresenting us. In fact, I've seen several articles that called me the father of open source. which is galling, I must tell you. So I respond by sending a letter to the editor saying, if I'm the father of open source, it was conceived through artificial insemination using stolen sperm without my knowledge or consent. <laughs> then, I present the ideas and name of the free software movement, in other words, telling the readers what was missing in the article itself, and that, of course, is the real point of the letter, but I figure starting with a joke can't hurt. I like jokes, but also maybe the joke will cause them to print the letter. Well, I do, I do this as much as I can, but I can't do enough of this. We need you to spread the idea that free software is a matter of freedom that users deserve. So when you're in a discussion and other people are talking about open source and presenting the issue as purely a practical one, you can help our movement simply by saying, uh, programming leader and insisting that this is a question of right and wrong. You can't make other people think so, but you can show that you think so. And there may be other people in the discussion who are thinking, I don't dare speak up about this because I don't want to be the only one. And once you speak up, they'll see they're not the only one. And they can speak up too. So it's very important for you to speak up even if you don't think you can convince all the other people, you will still achieve something by showing that one person in that discussion does care about freedom. <clears throat> because ultimately our future depends above all on what we value. If we could magically make free software to do every job, then say today, then we can hand this out to people and assuming we can also tell them the signature keys so that they can make modified versions and tell their machines to run them in the case of those pirate machines I, I mentioned in the connection with Freedom One, well then every user could switch to free software. Then tomorrow everyone could be running only free software. They would have freedom in their computing at least but would they still have it in five years? Not necessarily. 
The fool and his freedom are soon parted. If you give somebody freedom but he doesn't appreciate it, he'll let it slip through his fingers. If he values freedom, he can close his hand and hold on to it. So if we want to establish lasting freedom, it's not enough just to give people freedom. We need to teach people to appreciate it so that they will defend it. Because free freedom is frequently threatened and to keep it, you need to defend it. <clears throat> the most important work to be done in the free software movement is not actually programming, although that's necessary, but teaching people to demand freedom. And this is more scarce. We have fewer people working to spread the idea of demanding freedom than we have people writing free software. After all, there are lots of people who are writing free software who think of it as open source. Now, they don't agree with us, but their work contributes to the world's free software. So if you want to help and do the thing that's needed the most, become an activist. For instance, like the organizers of Chapter. <clears throat> we have gained freedom and lost it again in the free software community specifically because we didn't value freedom enough. For instance, in 1992, when Torvalds liberated Linux, it filled the last gap in the GNU system and we got GNU plus Linux. You could buy a new PC and install the system in it and use it in freedom. But it wasn't easy. At the beginning, you had to tinker with it. You had to get to be a real expert. So, people started working on distributions of GNU slash Linux. Ah, if you want to buy something, could you sell it to him? Yeah, if, if you could, if you'd like to buy any of those things, she can sell them to you. The stickers are gratis, you can take those. Uh, <clears throat> so, people began developing distributions of GNU slash Linux designed to make installation easier. A few years later, there were several distributions in competition in a community where most people didn't appreciate the issue in terms of freedom. And so the developers of one distro had the idea that they could gain against their competitors by adding non-free programs and presenting them as an advantage of their distro. So they did it and it worked because the users saw the, the added convenience. They didn't understand that this was lost freedom. So then the developers of other distros looked at that and said, uh oh, they're gaining on us because they have these convenient non-free programs. We have to put in non-free programs also so that they won't have an advantage over us. Over the next few years, all the distros put in non-free programs. Ten years ago, there were dozens of distros competing and all of them were non-free. So when people ask me, where can I get the system, I had to say, I don't know any place I can recommend to you. There are dozens of distros, but not one that's entirely free software, not one that I can ethically recommend. In other words, we had reached freedom, and we had fallen back because we didn't appreciate freedom enough to hold on to it. At least not most of our community. Few of us did, but we were too few to lead the community with us. Well, I'm happy to say that today there are some completely free distros of GNU slash Linux. For instance, there is Ututo, U-T-U-T-O, and there is Black, 
which stands for Black, Linux, and GNU. And there is GNU sense, which is also a joke. You see, it sounds like my job title. As head of the GNU project, I am the chief GNU sense. And there is Triskel, and there is Dragora, and uh, Parabola. The list of them you can find in gnu.org slash distros. If you have heard of a distro, and I didn't mention it, that's because that distro is not entirely free software. The well-known popular distros continue to install and recommend non-free programs. We wish they would stop, but they don't. There are over a thousand distros, and around ten of them are free. So we have begun to recover the freedom that we lost, but only begun. Well, since then, another problem occurred. We lost our freedom in another way. Nowadays, the, co the code of Linux, Torvalds' kernel, is not entirely free software. Oh, most of it is. But there are pieces which are exceptions. There are non-free programs in Linux. In fact, there are parts of the Linux source code which are not free software because they're not real source code. You'll find long lists of numbers, up to 300,000 numbers in a list. And each of these lists is really an executable program dressed up as source code. But you can't make source code out of an executable program by writing it as a list of decimal numbers or hex numbers. It's still just a binary executable. The real source code of those programs is not available. So they're called binary blobs. In addition, many of them explicitly carry non-free licenses. So they're non-free for two reasons at once. So how did they get into Linux? Well, Torvalds decided to put them in. Why did he do that? Well, he was never in favor of freedom as an ethical issue, so for him, this wasn't an ethical, cho ethical choice to make. Initially, he released Linux as proprietary software. Then later, he made it free software. And then later, he put in non-free bits. And at each point, it wasn't an ethical issue for him because he was never a defender of this kind of freedom at all. And what this shows is when our freedom depends on somebody who doesn't value freedom, it's precarious. Because he could decide to stop upholding our freedom, and for him it would just be a practical choice. Well, once we found out about this, we realized we could not ethically recommend Torvalds' version of Linux, because that was recommending some non-free software. So, people developed Linux Libre, which is our free modified version of Linux, where we delete the blobs. This is not a lot of work. In fact, we have scripts to do it. So every time Torvalds releases a new version of his Linux, we run the deblobber and we release a new version of Linux Libre. Well, good, that's easy. Uh, it solves the immediate problem. It gives us a kernel that is free software. It does not solve the underlying problem. Why did Torvalds think of putting these non-free programs into Linux? Because there are peripherals that won't work unless the kernel has a blob in it. So that means we can't use those peripherals in the free world. That's just a fact for today. It's impossible to use those peripherals and have freedom. So that means distributors of GNU slash Linux have a choice. They can either maintain freedom or they can make those peripherals work. 
So Torvalds chose the latter. He decided to put in those non-free programs quietly and not, it doesn't even tell you this peripheral was using a non-free program. So he papered over the underlying problem. Whereas we recognize the underlying problem. We say, our kernel doesn't work for those peripherals because we don't have free software that can do the job. If you want freedom, you've got to do without using that peripheral. Get a replacement. We have a, a site called h-node.org, which lists which peripherals do and do work with free software. So you can tell what you need to get. Now, we'd really like to fix the underlying problem. There are two ways to do that. One is convincing a company to liberate the source code of its blog. And occasionally that's possible. But usually what has to be done is reverse engineering. Meaning you figure out how that hardware works. And you... <clears throat> And you then, once you know the specs of the hardware, well, we have people who can re write the software to run it. I think it's shocking that companies sell you a product and they refuse to tell you how to use it. In fact, maybe that should be illegal. But for the moment, it's a common practice and therefore, we need reverse engineering. If you want to make a big contribution to the free software community through technical work, the way to do it is with reverse engineering. Because that's what would enable you to make a big difference. So, these are two examples. There are more, but two were enough to show that our future depends above all on what we value. If we are to have freedom in the future, we need to spread the idea of valuing freedom. And that includes being willing to make a sacrifice for it. Like saying, I won't do that job on my computer because it can't be done with free software. I'm going to replace this peripheral rather than run a blob or a non-free driver to use the peripheral because I really want freedom. And when you do this and you show it to other people, you set an example. That example is vitally important. <clears throat> Nowadays, it's quite likely that you are running non-free software on your computer without even knowing it got there. Many web pages contain non-free programs, typically written in JavaScript, that get installed silently into the browser and run. Until a year ago, the only way to prevent this from happening was to deactivate JavaScript. So, I did. I wasn't going to let any non-free programs run on my computer. Well, there's some sites I can't use. That's part of the sacrifice I make in the, for the cause of freedom. I'm not going to surrender my freedom to use those sites. <clears throat> but now we have a program called LibreJS. It's an add-on for Firefox, which analyzes all the JavaScript code that tries to get into the, your browser. And it checks whether it's either trivial or free. And in those cases, it's allowed to run. But if it's non-trivial and non-free, then it's blocked. And the program warns you. It says there's non-trivial, non-free JavaScript in this page. And it also heuristically searches the site for where to complain. Because we need people to complain to the webmasters and say, I can't use your site because it demands non-free software and I won't run non-free software. Please fix your site. 
But it's a lot of work to complain because you have to search for how to do it. Well, LibreJS does the searching for you so you can immediately enter your complaint. Please do complain. We need to get them lots of complaints. However, nowadays there's a way you can lose control over your computing without actually running a non-free program. And that's Software as a Service, or SACS. Software as a Service means that instead of doing your own computing in your own computer by running a program, you send all the relevant data to somebody else's server, and, the, and your computing gets done in his server, done by programs that are, control, that are chosen by him, not by you. He may or may not actually control them. They might be non-free, meaning he doesn't control them either. But it actually doesn't matter to you whether those programs are free. Because if they are free, that means he controls them but you still don't. And then when it's done, it sends the results back to you or else it takes action for you with others. But either way, you have lost control of your computing. And the only way to avoid that is reject SAS. Don't let your own computing be done in somebody else's server by software controlled by, chosen by him. So SAS is inherently equivalent to running a non-free program, but it's actually even worse. Remember how I explained that some, many non-free programs spy on the user? They send data to some server, well, with SAS, the user has to send all the pertinent data to a server. It's the same end result. It's produced by a different path, but it's the same result. There's a server which has your data, and who knows what it's going to do with that data. Well, if it's in the U.S., we know one thing. It'll hand over that data to Big Brother without even a court order because the U.S. has a law that tramples human rights in this way. They call it the Patriot Act. I call it the Pat Riot Act, because in a country founded on the idea of freedom, there is nothing less patriotic than this, except perhaps flying death squads. Oh, we have those too. <clears throat> Well, there's another bad thing. Remember, I explained how some proprietary programs have universal backdoors that allow remote imposition of software changes. These include Microsoft Windows, Google Chrome, which is a non-free browser, and most portable, nearly all portable phones. Well, that means somebody can change how the user's computing gets done without asking the user's permission. With SAS, it's the same, because the computing gets done by the programs installed in the server. And the server owner, of course, can put in different programs and change how the user's computing gets done without asking permission. So SAS is inherently equivalent to using a proprietary program with spy features and a universal backdoor. Very bad. And just as you must reject proprietary software for freedom's sake, you must reject SAS for freedom's sake. Now, if you look at all the world's web websites, SAS is a rare case. And the reason is, almost all of these sites just present information for Using them is not doing your own computing. So the SAS issue simply doesn't arise. But if we consider the ones that do a non-trivial service, most of those services are some kind of communication with others, which includes e-commerce. That's a kind of communication. Well, that's not your own computing, personally. So the issue of SAS doesn't arise. But there are some, they're, they're a small fraction, but some of them are important, which are SAS. For instance, there is a 
There are the translation services, which I won't use because we ought to be able to do translation by having programs in our own computers, programs that are free and that are under our control. Getting a translation of the text, if that's what you want to do, is your own computing. It doesn't involve anybody else. It's not anybody else's, it's entirely your computing, and that's where you should have control. So, my last point is about free software and education. All educational activities, including schools from kindergarten to the university, must teach exclusively free software. And there are several reasons for this. It's not just a matter of saving money. That's a secondary benefit that often is possible, but that's not what's really important. This is not a question of how to do education a little better or a little more efficiently. This is a question of how to do good ethical education rather than bad education. Why is it that some companies will donate gratis copies of their non-free software to schools. It's because they want to use the school as an instrument to impose dependence on society. And so they deliver these gratis copies, the school teaches the students to use them, and the students become dependent on that program. And then they graduate and they're still dependent. And the same company, the same developer, will not offer those ex-students gratis copies. Oh no. And some of those students go to work for companies. The developer does not offer those companies gratis copies. Oh no. Because the whole point is that the school directs the students down the path of dependence, and those students pull the rest of society with them into dependence. It's just like what drug traffickers do when they say, uh, try this, the first dose is gratis. They want people to become dependent. Well, the school would refuse to hand out these drugs and it should refuse the proprietary software as well, whether it's gratis or not, because the school has a social mission, which is to educate good citizens of a strong, capable, cooperating, independent, and free society. In the computing field, this means graduating skilled users of free software who are ready to participate in a free digital society but it means never teaching a proprietary program because implanting dependence goes against the social mission of the school. But there's a deeper reason for the education of the best programmers. <coughs> Some people are natural born programmers. They have a natural talent. And at typically the age of 10 to 13, they become fascinated with programming. And if they use a program, they want to know, how does it do this? But when they ask the teacher, how does it do this? If it's proprietary, the teacher can only say, I'm sorry, it's a secret, we can't find out. Every program embodies knowledge. If it's proprietary, that knowledge is withheld from the student. A proprietary program is the enemy of the spirit of education and therefore must never be tolerated in a school. Schools must demonstrate that they uphold the spirit of education by saying, no proprietary software here. But if the program is free, the teacher can explain whatever he knows and then It's really unclear, so don't write code that way. That's an example of how not to write it. Now that's what these people need to develop from natural born programmers into 
good programmers. They need to learn all the things that you shouldn't do because they won't be clear. How do you learn to write good, clear code? You do it by reading lots of code and writing lots of code. Well, only free software gives people the chance to read the code of large programs we really use. Then you have to write lots of code. You have to learn to write code for large programs, you have to write code for large programs. But in doing this, you have to start small. How do you start small in writing code for large programs? You do it by writing small changes in existing large programs. Only free software gives it a chance to write changes in existing large programs that we really use. Any school can give students the opportunity to master the skill of programming, but only if it's a free software school. But there's an even deeper reason for moral education, education in citizenship. Schools must go beyond teaching facts and skills. They must teach the spirit of goodwill and the habit of helping others. Therefore, every class should have this rule. Students, if you bring software to class, you may not keep it for yourself. You must share copies with the rest of the class, including the source code in case someone here wants to learn, because this class is a place for sharing our knowledge. Therefore, bringing proprietary software to class is not permitted. But in order to set a good example, the school has to follow its own rule. It must bring only free software to class, and share copies, including source code, with everyone in the class. If you have a relationship with a school, if you're a student, a teacher, an employee, a parent, it's your responsibility to campaign for that school to move to free software. Now, it's important to bring up the issue publicly to, so that others have a chance to learn to understand it. Discussing it privately with the school authorities can be useful sometimes, but don't stick to that for too long if it doesn't work. Start bringing it up in public. The willingness to make a sacrifice is crucial. If you say in the first meeting of a class, Professor, please let's work out a way that I can do the work of this class using free software only, because my conscience does not allow me to run the proprietary software and I'm willing to do it with free software even if it takes me extra work. It's hard for a professor to say no to a student who wants to do extra work for the sake of her conscience. But some of them will. And in that case you have to say, well, goodbye, I will try again next year and hope that, there, that I get a different answer. Sometimes you should change schools. If there's a school that requires using a lot of proprietary software, changing schools may be what you need to do. A protest may be called for. If a school does something that promotes proprietary software, a protest is appropriate. You'll have to be creative looking for different approaches till you find something that works. The important thing is be persistent. For more information about free software, look at GNU.org and FSF.org, which is the site of the Free Software Foundation. Now, you can join the Free Software Foundation and we need your support. You can join through the website. If you want to pay your annual dues in cash, you could join here. Uh, there is also the Free Software Foundation Europe at fsfe.org, which also needs your support. So, at this point, I would like to present my other identity. People who left already, they missed on missed the funniest part. It's too bad.
at St. Ignatius of the Church of Emacs. I bless your computer, my child. Emacs started out as an extensible text editor that I wrote, which became a way of life for many users, as over the years it was extended so much that they could do all their computing without ever leaving Emacs. And then it became a church with the launch of the news group alt.religion.emacs, which you might find amusing to visit. In the Church of Emacs today, we have no services, only software. We have a great schism between several rival versions of Emacs. And we also have saints, but fortunately no gods. Instead of gods, we adore the one true editor, Emacs. To become a member of the Church of Emacs, you must pronounce the confession of the faith. You must say, there is no system but GNU, and Linux is one of its kernels. <laughs> then, if you become a real expert, you can celebrate that with our ceremony the Fubar Mitzvah, <laughs> in which you chant a portion of our sacred scriptures, that is to say, the system source code. In the Church of Emacs, we have abolished the priesthood of technology. Everyone is welcome to read our sacred texts. <clears throat> we also have the cult of the Virgin of Emacs which refers to anyone who has never used Emacs. And according to the Church of Emacs, offering the opportunity to lose Emacs virginity is a blessed act. We also have the Emacs pilgrimage, which consists of invoking all the commands of Emacs in alphabetical order. <laughs> There is a Tibetan sect which holds that it's sufficient to invoke them automatically under the control of the script. However, the mainstream church believes that to get spiritual merit from the pilgrimage, you must type them all by hand. <laughs> the Church of Emacs has certain advantages compared with other churches that I won't name. For instance, to be a saint in the Church of Emacs does not require celibacy. But it does require living a life of moral purity. You must exorcise whatever evil proprietary systems have possessed computers under your control. And then install a wholly free operating system. and then only use and install free software with and on the system. If you make this vow and live by it, then you too will be a saint and you'll have the right to wear a halo, if you can find one because they don't make them anymore. <laughs> People have sometimes asked whether, according to the Church of Emacs, it is a sin to use the other editor, VI. It's true that VI, VI, VI is the editor of the beast. <laughs> but using a free implementation of VI is not a sin, it's a penance. <laughs> and people have sometimes asked whether my halo is really an old computer disk. This is no computer disk, this is my halo. But it was a computer disk in a previous life. So thank you.
say I don't have a little GNU to auction today. Uh, there wasn't time to ship. But I do have this copy of my semi-autobiography, which ha it's a semi-autobiography because someone else wrote it and put in his point of view, and then I fixed the errors and put in my point of view, but I left his personal impressions. So it now presents these two points of view in contrast. And I'm going to auction this on behalf of the Free Software Foundation. I'll be happy to sign it for you if you're the purchaser. And we will, we can accept payment in cash or with a credit card. If your credit card can make international purchases by phone, it will work with us too. And to start with, um, I guess I should start the, the at its usual price, which is uh, about seventy lei. So, and I want and I want to go up by at least five each time to save time for this. So, do I get seventy? When you bid, oh, if you're not bidding, please be quiet so I can hear the people who are. And when you bid, please wave your arm and shout. So do I get 70? How much? I've got 70. Do I get 75? How much? I've got 75. Do I get 80? Who's 80? I got 80. Do I get 85? 85? Do I get 90? He said 90 first. Do I get 95? He said it first. Do I get 100? I've got, you said 120? I've got 120. Do I get 130? Oh, okay. Were you bidding 130 first? I've got 130. Do I get... No, now I want to go up by 10. I don't want to go up by tiny fractions because it would take too long. Do I get 140 or more? 150. Do I get 160? I've got 160, do I get 170? I've got 170, do I get 180? 180. Uh, he said 180, do I get 190? How much? 190? I've got 190, do I get 200? Uh, I've got 200, do I get 220? 220, do I get 240? I've got 220, do I get 240? Where? I don't see. Who? Are you bidding? How much? I've got 240. Do I get 260? I've got 240. Do I get 260? Do I get 260? How much? 260? I've got 260. Do I get 280? I've got 280. Do I get 300? I've got 300. Do I get 320? I've got, do I've got 300, do I get 320? Do I get 320? How much? I, how much? I've got 320, do I get 340? I've got 320, do I get 340? Do I get 340 or more? I've got 340, do I get 360? I've got 340, do I get 360? Do I get 360 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? <laughs> How much? How much is he saying? I've got 360. Do I get 380? I've got... How much? I've got 400. Do I get 440? I want to speed this up, you know, get to the same end point faster. Do I get 440? I've got 400. Do I get 440? Do I get 440 to the Free Software Foundation to defend freedom? <laughs> what? Well, I'd like to have a little GNU, but I don't have it, fortunately. So do I get 440? Well, 
Well, of course I'm going to sign it for the purchaser. What's the difference? Well, oh yeah, of course. I'll, I will dedicate it to you if you're the purchaser. So I've got 400. Do I get 440? Last chance to bid 440 or more. Last chance. Going. Going. Gone for 400. So please come up and, and pay for it. But I will, the FSF will sell, I'll, I'll do the signing and dedication after the questions. Uh, the FSF will sell things for credit cards. Uh, oh, please make a note that copying does not imply plagiarism. Plagiarism is a form of lying. It means pretending to have written something which you in fact got from somebody else. It has nothing to do with copyright. And if you copy that book, which you're free to do, uh, and you say who, who the authors are, that's not plagiarism. Uh, so anyway, we can accept uh, questions on paper, which is actually easiest for me, but also we can have people come to a queue at the front of the room and ask questions. Uh, please, come, please, we need a microphone here. And please stand up and come to the front where the microphone will be. Yeah, come up. But come to the front where the microphone is and ask your question. Because it takes a long time to transport the microphone around the room. And this is a much better system. But even with the microphone, you need to speak loud and clearly because I have some hearing problems. If you speak, I don't want to say right now. Yeah. Would you say uh, copyright actually encourages plagiarism? I have no idea and I don't care. I want Basically, to use that as another argument. In I, have no reason, I have no reason to believe copyright encourages plagiarism. Copyright raises other ethical issues. My views on copyright are not simple. First of all, there are some works that are designed to be used to do practical jobs. Those works must be free. But copyright is not the only method that's used to make them non-free. So if we only abolish copyright for those works, that actually won't make them free. For instance, with software, one principal way of making a program non-free is by not releasing the source code. That's not a legal method, it's a technical method. Also, contracts are typically used. Copyright is actually a secondary method of making programs non-free. Also, tyrant devices that refuse to execute modified versions are another secondary way of making programs non-free. So we need to resist and put an end to all of those methods of making programs non-free. And we use copyright to do it. Because copyleft, the legal technique I invented, uses copyright law. So if we abolish copyright for programs, it would actually be a disaster for free software and better for proprietary software. Because all our source code is published. Without copyright, they could make our source code into proprietary software and we would have no weapon to fight back and defend freedom with. So I would be in favor, in principle, of changing laws so that all programs and other and, and educational works and reference works had to be free. But this would be a much bigger change. Just abolishing copyright for those works would not do it. 
but I don't actually recommend that change for today's society. It's it's too big a change, and uh, maybe someday we'll see a society where that would be accepted. I'd like to uh, hear your take on um, something I've been thinking about, which is a subtle change in how uh, we as a society do computing with the shift to mobile, and that is that right now there are three sets of uh, commercial interests uh, at play that we have to think about when we uh, defend our freedoms, as opposed to um, uh, just two sets of commercial interests. Can you in get the, to the point? Quickly? Yes, uh, in, the, in the traditional uh, computing, we used uh, uh, net notebooks and uh, desktops, and there were the hardware builders and the software builders, uh, and uh, some of them could exert pressure on the others. But uh, right now, there's three sets of commercial interests, the hardware builders, the software builders, and the, uh, the wireless carriers. And uh, it seems to me that it gets uh, a lot harder to defend your freedoms. I agree. In fact, right now there is no uh, mobile phone being made, and I don't know of any tablet being made, which you can run without some non-free software. And in the case of the mobile phones, the non-free software is where the back door is. So. How to do something about that? Well, we're looking at what kind of initiative we can start to try to change this. It's, it's tremendously complicated because even the hardware is not really made by one company. Uh, there are several layers of companies, and the ones that make the products that people can buy don't even have control over this. So it's a horrible situation. I wouldn't use any of those. Next question. Oh, and there's another issue raised by them, which is that they're, they tend to be designed to push people into software as a service and into storing their data in some company server. And of course, you can't trust that company with your privacy. Uh, hello. I would like to ask you, what can we do about uh, large computing tasks that require massive amounts of hardware resources, much, much more than a user has available in his personal PC? Well, most for people example, don't do these things. For example, search on the internet. Oh, but you see, search is a different kind of issue. If you're looking at a search engine, that's not your own computing. That's looking at somebody else's data. So I don't see any fundamental problem with search engines as they are now. Now, it's very important that the search engine not know who you are. Because they, could, they do surveillance. Okay, but uh, search, uh, search engines are kind of uh, service software as a service. No, they're not software as a service, not as I use the term. Because software as a service means that it's doing your computing on your data. Now, if you want to look through somebody else's data, that's not the same kind of thing. Uh, okay, so you're in favor of Google's search engine. I don't see anything fundamentally wrong with Google's search engine. Now, there are some specific things that it does that are bad, but just being a search engine like that isn't bad. The problems with Google's search engine are they keep track of people, and they, which is already bad, and they send different results depending on who you are, which is a, also a problem. And finally, it sends non-free JavaScript code to the user's browser, so it's trying to get people to run non-free software. However, it'll still work if you disable JavaScript and don't run that, that non-free program. Uh, one last question related. Uh, what search engine are you currently using? Well, I don't, I don't do searches very often because it takes a long time, and usually I ask somebody else to do them for me. Uh, but when I do a search for myself, I typically use DuckDuckGo. But 
I wouldn't see a problem with using Google's search engine because Google has no way of associating those searches with me. I don't ever do it. I would only do it from other people's computers that I can borrow for a while, and thus Google can't tell that all those searches are even coming from the same person. Okay. And nobody else could tell either. You know, DuckDuckGo says they don't track people. We don't have a way of verifying that that's true. It might be true, but we can't really know. Why is it that software companies don't see the potential financial benefit of creating uh, something users could modify and offer technical support for those who do not have the knowledge to make changes in the code themselves? Well, you know, maybe they do see their, tech, their own selfish interests. I don't make the argument that these companies that make non-free software are being foolish. I make the argument that they're doing something unjust, which I think is much more important than whether they're, whether they're causing themselves to lose money. Because fundamentally, it's not our ethical concern whether they get money or not. We, I have a much more important criticism to make rather than just saying they might make less money because they're being nasty to us. And since emperor, since empires often are profitable to the emperor, maybe they are profiting from their power over us. But that doesn't excuse it. Next question. Hello everybody, my name is Andre Mana. Hello Richard, I have a question for you. You, in your speech until now, you told us about the disadvantages that non-free software has for our society. Uh, we are a community here, we, under, we are passionate about technology and we can understand all those, all those issues, but we are not the majority. The majority is not passionate about technologies and they do not understand all those issues related to non-free software. To Get to the point, please. The point is that um, how can we make the government, which the government feds our educational system, how can we make them... I don't know. I'm a foreigner. I know of some methods that have been useful in some other countries. But I don't know what will work here. All I can do is come here briefly and show you what these issues are. But figuring out how to be politically effective it's going to be up to you. Yes, the question was an open question, not for you, was for the Free Software Foundation, which militates for the freedom of the software, and also for the community of Chata, which should imply, which should involve directly into our government and try to make the, um, try to... I don't know. I don't know what you're, what the, I mean, I've heard some things about Romania's government that say that the, they're fighting each other and it's a horrible situation. What's going to work politically here now or in five years from now? I don't know. The problem is not about politics. The problem is about having a good idea. The thing is that uh, currently in Romania we have a problem. For the government and the, for the public administration, software means a tool for them to make money. They don't see software as a tool that Maybe you that need to go to the general public and educate the public first. I really don't know. I'm sorry. You want something from me that I wish I could give you, but I don't have it. And why would I have it, after all? I'm a foreigner. I don't know what the situation is like here. I, I can, you know, I, when talking with people from Chata and other people today, I'll be able to give some ideas of methods that can work somewhere, but that doesn't mean that I know what will work here. But we as a community and you as a defender of the free software should find some solutions because... The I'm sorry, please, you've already asked me. I've already told you what I know. I wish I had a, a, a path to lay out, but I don't. So let's go to the next question. Thank you. What do you think about personal fabricators? I think they're great. 
However, they're mainly something for the future. Today, that's in its infancy. Almost all of the objects that we use could not be made with a 3D printer. Maybe in 50 years, we'll make almost all of our objects with our own personal devices. And that, I think, might be very nice. But we have to recognize that today it's more of a hint about possibilities than a, a reality. It is a reality to a limited extent. Now, I started to mention my views on copyright. I explained my views on works designed to be used for practical jobs. There are also other kinds of works, like this speech, a statement of my opinions. There are works of art and entertainment. Those are a different kind of issue. I don't advocate abolishing copyright. There are people who think I'm too conservative, but this is my view. I think copyright is legitimate, but it's too restrictive today. For instance, we must legalize sharing. Now, when I say sharing, I have a specific meaning in mind. I mean non-commercial redistribution of exact copies. Also, other countries must adopt fair use along the same lines as in the U.S. Maybe they should go a bit further than the U.S. currently does. And <clears throat> remix must be legal because remix is a way of making new works. The purpose of copyright law is to encourage making new works. To interpret copyright as prohibiting remix is perverse. And, of course, we know the cause of this perversion. It's commercial interests of publishers that want to turn copyright into just their extortion scheme. But these changes, also we need to make copyright last for a shorter period of time. I propose 10 years starting from the date of publication of the work. And we need to ban the other practices that deny the users the rights that copyright law lets them have. For instance, we have to ban the end user license agreements. We have to ban digital handcuffs that would deny people their rights under copyright law. Copyright law as modified with these changes. So, now I can respond to your question because when we when you make objects with personal fabricators, there are files that you use that specify what the object should be. Well, some of these objects are made for functional use. Some of them are purely decorative. So we now have two kinds of work here. We have the, the file that controls the object can be a work of practical use if it makes a utilitarian object and it's a, a, an artistic work if it makes a decorative object. And I believe that those files should, be, should follow the general points about copyright law that I just said. So if it makes a decorative, if it makes a useful object, it should be free. The file should be free. If it makes a decorative object, well, people should be free to share it and remix and, and so on. Also another question. Would you say uh, free as in freedom? services would be impossible? It's not a meaningful question because these, the four freedoms that define free software, they make sense for any kind of work you can have a copy of because then you could copy it, you could change it and the question is should you be allowed to do so? And I've given you my answer on that which is a complicated answer. But a service is not a thing you can have and copy. So these questions don't arise. There are other ethical issues that arise about services, like do they abuse your data? Do they surveil you and collect more data than you thought you were giving them? Do they take control of your computing? In other words, are they software as a service? These are different issues. There might be others as well. But it's a mistake to try to generalize the idea of free software to anything other than works you can have copies of. Because that's where they make sense. Next question. Hello. 
you might have touched on this a little bit, but I'm just going to ask it anyway. So if you are an author or an artist, it can be super rewarding, but you're often depending on a steady paycheck. So because you're not getting it, you're depending on how well you're selling your art or your if work. If you could get straight to the point. Yeah. So artists usually have a skewed view and are conflicted about uh, about authorship rights. So on one hand, they want to share... Yeah, if you could get to the point, please. What's the question? So the question is, how does that fit with the free software movement? Because as an artist... Okay, well, first of all, free software is about software, not about art. But I just said what my idea is about copyright for art are. We, I don't propose to abolish copyright, but there are certain things that people must be free to do. Now, how does this affect artists? The existing copyright system, as a system of supporting artists, is lousy. There are a few stars that can get a, a high income, they may even get to be rich, but those are very few. And then there are lots of artists, and even if they're fairly popular, the existing system fails to support them adequately, and they need to have other jobs. So, uh, when the publishers demand increased power over us, they always say it's in the name of the artists, and that's 95% lie and 5% true, or something like that. Because it may be true for the superstars, but it's false for all the other artists. So, since I appreciate some art, I recognize that we need to support artists, but not at the expense of a war on sharing, which is what we see today. And besides, given that the existing system is so bad, it's ridiculous to defend it and tighten it up. That would mainly support the publishers better, plus somewhat the superstars. It wouldn't do any good for other artists. So, I have proposed two systems for supporting artists which fit with legalizing sharing, fit with the reforms to copyright that I've proposed. One system would be run by the state in the sense that the state would collect money from taxes and it would distribute this money directly to artists based on the measured popularity of each artist, but not in linear proportion. Maybe in Orson Welles' society? I can't hear you, what? Maybe in Orson Welles' utopic society, but not I don't. I don't know, but in any case, I haven't finished it yet. I haven't finished saying it. The point is, you don't distribute the money in linear proportion. Why not? Because the stars are so much more popular than the other artists. If we distributed the money in linear proportion to popularity, most of it would go to the stars. And it wouldn't really help the other artists enough to, do, to be worth doing it. So, because you know, a star A could be a thousand times as popular as a non-star who's fairly successful B. And if we distribute the money in linear proportion, A would get a thousand times as much as B. Almost all the money would go to the stars. And in, because in order to give B enough money for the necessities of life, we would have to make A super rich. Well, this is a wasteful use of our money, and I'm not in favor of it. What I say is, let's take the cube root of the popularity of each artist. The cube root of a thousand is ten. If A is a thousand times as popular as B, and we use the cube root, then A will get ten times as much money as B. Instead of a thousand times, just ten times. So this shifts most of the money from the stars to the artists of medium popularity. And this way, we could have a system that efficiently supports artists, that supports a considerable number of mid-popularity artists adequately so that they don't need to have another job. And yes, with this system, the more popular you are, the more money you get. So each star will get more than a non-star, but they won't get astronomically more. Now, why the cube root? I'm not saying it has to be the cube root. Maybe the fourth root is better, or maybe the 3.5 root will turn out to be the best. I mean, someone would need to study this. But this kind of system is a way that we could support the artists in general 
better than the existing system with less money. The second method I've proposed is with voluntary payments. Suppose each player has a button. You push the button and it sends, well, maybe one leo to the artist. Well, each country would say how much money it should be. And I presume would choose the amount, trying to maximize the total that gets sent every year. And people would push the button and send if they want to. If they don't do it, no penalty would be imposed on them. But it feels good to send some money to an artist. And if we make it a small amount of money, well, lots of people will think, sure, I'll send it. Because, you know, unless you're poor, you won't miss that small amount of money. But there are poor people who really can't afford to do it. And what will they do? They'll tape something over the button so that they can't accidentally push it. They'll never send money, and that's good because we don't want to get make poor people support artists. There are enough non-poor people who will be happy to support artists. So these are my two proposals. There are also there are many different ways to combine ideas from these two proposals. There are lots of different ways to set it up. The point is, if we want to support artists, and I think we should support artists, we shouldn't do it by reinforcing the cruel war against the users of the works. We should look for these other ways that depend on, that don't depend on stopping people from sharing, that reject the idea, if you look at the work, you owe money to the artist. Of course, and ten times as much to the publisher. Thank you. I mean, the reality is people people do want to share their works, but they can't because they have to earn a living. Like people want to share, but it's it's. Like well, the point is, people do share, and there's a war on sharing, trying to stop people from sharing, and we have to defeat the enemy. The enemy is the publishers, but. Those of us who appreciate art will have to support arts. I support arts mainly by buying copies. And I'm happy when I can. But nowadays, with music for instance, often there is no ethical distributor. There's no way, because the only ethical distributor is a CD store. A physical CD store that lets you pay cash. I won't buy CDs over the internet because I can't buy them anonymously. If we had an anonymous payment system, maybe I could buy CDs over the internet, and then I would. There's some I'd like to buy. There is. There's Bitcoin. No. Developers, when I say artists, I'm talking about the people who make artistic works. Works that are to be appreciated. So, okay, the, these two payment systems will work for art. They will not work for software. And here's why. To use these kinds of payment systems, you need to be able to see who should get how much of each dollar or euro that goes to that work. Well, with a work that is not free, that people can't modify, you know who the contributors are. And there were not so many of them. They could make an agreement at the beginning about how they would divide up this money. Or there could be just a legal rule for how you divide it up by default. And then the work doesn't get changed for as long as copyright lasts. Or if it does get changed, it's because they gave permission. They could agree how, how the money will be divided for the modified work. In the case of music, there are rules allowing uh, musicians to play a piece. And the rules say who's going to get how much. So the point is these systems can function. But when you look at works of practical use that are free, you will see that people are constantly contributing to them, constantly making modified versions. There can be thousands of contributors. And those they didn't all decide at the beginning that they would contribute. No, they came along later. It's, as far as I can tell, completely impossible to come up with a scheme for how to distribute the money. Therefore, when we raise funds for work on, on works of practical use, what makes sense is 
to have people, it, it's to contribute to projects to, for, for making further improvement to them. No, 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 they don't. You're wrong. Free software exists already and we don't have any simple scheme to pay the developers. Yet free software is written anyway. What this proves is we don't need such a scheme. Now there are ways of paying some free software developers. There are free software developers who are paid for their work. Some of them are paid by big companies that think it's useful to have that free software available. Some are being, are, have small companies where they're doing work for clients, but in the process of doing it, they improve the certain free programs. So in fact, some people are getting paid. And another method that works nowadays is crowdfunding, where people say, we want to do this project. Please pledge money. If we get this much money, we'll work on it. Well, it's starting to actually be effective. So, in fact, there are some ways of paying people to write free software. There isn't a simple, universal way that's effective for all cases, but there's enough that lots of free software work gets done, but also keep in mind that a lot of it's done by volunteers. So it's a mistake to think a free program won't exist unless we have a way of paying someone. I have a simpler solution to No, if you have to survive, that just means maybe you need to get some other job. Right? I have a if you're not rich, if you're not rich, you may have to get a job. And that may limit how much time you have for free software. No, that's not true. I wasn't rich at all when I started working on GNU. I didn't know how I would make a living. I just decided I was going to do all I could. So, you're exaggerating. Uh, sure, it would be nice if we had better social systems for paying people to work on free software. But it's an exaggeration to claim that without them we can't get anywhere. Because we got where we are. And where we are is a big advance over zero. I have a simpler solution to all this. It may be utopic, but why don't we <laughs> completely abolish intellectual property in its entirety? As Sorry. It's copyright. Uh, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a, it's a foolish thing to use the term, quote, intellectual property, unquote, because it talks about several... Yes, a lot of awesome. Well, I'm not interested in looking for radical solutions that have yes, no but, reason behind them, except a confused term that some other people use. These laws have nothing in common, and yet you're treating them as if they were one issue. That's a recipe for careless thinking. Copyrights and patents have nothing to do with each other. Copyrights and trademarks have nothing to do with each other. I think trademark law is pretty good, actually. It may, there's some details that could use change, but for the most part I think trademark law is a useful thing. I don't want to abolish it. Now why did you get to that suggestion? It's because other people lumped together these unrelated laws, and so uh, using the misleading term, quote, intellectual property, unquote, and that suggests that it makes sense to use that term in your thinking. But my position is it never makes sense to use that term. I reject that term. I never use it. Because these laws are too different. I ha they have to be thought about separately. Yes, but information, be it uh, art or be it ideas or be it any kind of information, does not have scarcity. Since it doesn't matter, have that scarcity. has nothing to do with trademark Being law. More times yes. for the same information. Right. This is a this is an argument that affects what we do with works, which is mainly ruled by copyright law. But trademark law is different. Trademark law is a way of having labels that say who made something. And that's a useful scheme which for the most part does good and not harm. So, this is why the term, this is an example of how the term, quote, intellectual property, unquote, leads to harmful overgeneralization. You have an argument that relates to copyright law, and that argument is why I believe we have to legalize sharing, which is a change in copyright law. 
But it has nothing to do with trademarks. Patent law is a different issue. Now, patents, patent law causes problems, three different kinds of problems in three different areas. It causes one problem in software, it causes a different problem in medicine, and it causes a different problem in agriculture. So, patent law does require some change, but patents on automobile engines as far as I can tell, you know, they may not do any good, but they may not do any harm either. There's some reason, there's some economic research suggesting the world would be better off without patent law. Maybe that's true, but it's only those three areas where it causes an acute problem. But the crucial point here is these three laws are different issues, and there are several more laws. If you say, every time you say, quote, intellectual property, unquote, you're also talking about the law that says you can't call a wine Bordeaux unless your vineyard is in a certain region of France. Is that good or bad? I don't know. But it doesn't stop anybody from making and selling wine. It just says they can't call it Bordeaux. Well, you know, it's not going to do you any terrible injustice to, that you can't call your wine Bordeaux. So I don't see any big ethical issue there. And then there's another, um, in the U.S., this, in, in some states in the U.S., there's a law uh, about, th that gives you power over the use of your image in anybody else's publicity. It seems to make sense to me. Uh, so the point is these laws are so different, it never makes sense to talk about all of them at once. So the term, quote, intellectual property, unquote, is pure confusion. We must object to this term. We must refuse to ever use it. So if Apple has a trademark on the name Apple, they can impose Apple um, agriculture farmers to... No, no, they can't, stop, they can't stop people from selling apples. Yeah, one, okay, one last question. Okay, well, but we have to finish the queue. Uh, okay. Okay. Well, well, let's get the next question. I'll try to keep it short. Um, given that the copyright law is the basis for the uh, public, public license, right? In my understanding. Yeah. You do general public license. General public name. license. Uh, then, what did you think of a? Uh, copyright law that has no concept of uh, uh, public domain? Well, I'm against it. I think work should go into the public domain, which is not the case now. It's almost not the case, because copyright lasts insanely long. So we need to shorten it. But yes, I am in favor of works going into the public domain after a reasonable time. Now, if it were very short, then copy left would cease to be effective. That's why I propose 10 years. I guess my question is a bit different in the sense that what would happen if there was no concept of the public domain in the public Well, I think that's bad. That would be perpetual copyright. Now, that's what the movie companies want, but that would be very bad. Hi, and welcome to Romania, of course. I can't understand because I don't hear the concepts. Sorry, can you hear me now? Is it okay? It's a bit better. Okay, thanks. So, uh, in the context of uh, the security of your own and other users' data, uh, would you agree or would you at least comment upon the idea that there need to be limits on which people can uh, modify and distribute which software? No, I don't agree at all. The biggest source of malware is proprietary software. I'm uh, not necessarily talking about malware, but of instances of compromise. Actually, well, but that's, what, that's why it's bad, you see, because they sneak malware into the computer. They take control of it. But as I've pointed out, proprietary systems also take control of it. So the only defense we know of is free software. Which gets compromised sometimes. Sometimes it does. But 
at least it gives us a defense against malware inserted by the developers, which is the biggest danger. Second quick question in this particular context. Uh, one, one question per person. If I have to finish the queue, it's going to be one question per person. I'm sorry. Okay. Code signing, good or bad in this context? Well, code signing is a fine security measure. It doesn't restrict anybody's freedom. That is free software code signing, where you check the signature, but you can ignore it if you want. That's not doing. That's not attacking your freedom at all. Now, code signing is practiced by Apple uh, and by tyrant devices. That's evil because they don't give you, the user, the chance to bypass it. Hello. Would you please uh, tell us a few words about the Freedom Box project? So oh, the Freedom Box project was launched by Eben Molin. The idea is to make a cheap, small, personal server that you can put in your house, and that way, if you want to store your data in a server, it can be your server, fully under your control, practically and legally. Because if you entrust your data to a company, you have fewer legal rights over that data. Thank you very much. And it, it is finished? It's, uh, it's well, yeah, it's available. Basically, there's a there's a piece of hardware you can buy, and there's a Freedom Box distro, which is entirely free software that runs in it. Even in Europe, we can buy it. I can't hear you. Even in Europe, we can buy it. I don't know exactly that. Sorry, you have to look at that. Thank you very much. Last question. Are you on the queue? Okay, then we're done. Good, we're done. No, are you, he wasn't in the queue when I, when I agreed to finish the queue. I need to go to the toilet. <laughs> okay. Thank you, Richard. În încheiere, aș vrea să vă mulțumesc tuturor pentru participare. Sper să ne revedem la evenimente și poate chiar în comunitate. Nu ne-am văzut în evenimente publice, poate și în evenimente din comunitatea noastră, Ceata. Dacă vreți să intrați în contact cu noi, e suficient să intrați la ceata.org și veți vedea acolo listele noastre de discuții și canalul de IRC. Aș vrea să mulțumesc că pentru găzduire Facultății de Științe Politice și Facultății de Drept. Îi mulțumesc Luciane Ica și sper să avem colaborări cu Ica Rândou. Îmi mulțumesc și Richard care acum mai e prezent. Le găsim, dacă ai să caut ceva referință, poți să găsesc pe site la tine. Da? Ok. Că încerc să...